from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. My name is Larry Applebaum from the Library of Congress. It's with great pleasure that I sit here and share the stage with Jose James, who will be performing tonight. But now we have a time to have a little chat, talk a bit about music, and especially his music. So please help me welcome Jose James. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, tell me, first of all, what we can expect tonight for the concert. Who's performing with you, and what kind of repertoire are you going to deal with? Um, well, I just signed the Blue Note records four days ago. So um, the album is done, and I'm featuring some of it, about half of the album, the new album. Um, did you produce the record? I did. I produced the, the album, and Pino Palladino, great bassist, was a co-producer. And Brian Bender, um, it was an amazing engineer in Brooklyn, is another co-producer. How did you and Pino start working? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, what you, happened? You knew his work all along. Oh, of course. I mean, Everybody he's knows. like the top bass player in the world, you know. So, you know, Voodoo. I mean, every 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 '90s album that's soulful that I own and loved, he's on. You know what I mean? Common and Badu and D'Angelo. So um, I met him in London. I was living in London. Mark DeClivelo was a piano player and producer uh, who was living in London and moved to LA, has a relationship with Red Bull Music Academy. And they were doing some recording and they're friends. And Pino, he's just a cool guy. He said, hey, who's, who's around? Who's in London? Who should I jam with? He always wants to jam, you know. He's a real musician. He's got an identifiable sound and a style as a player. Do you think he's got an identifiable, identifiable sound as a producer? I think he does, you know, and as a writer. We also, we, well, that's how we got together. We started writing a song. Mm. So that was really like the catalyst for him to get involved. And I think, you know, when we say producer, it can mean a lot of things in this day and age, especially. His main um, contribution was bringing together a lot of people who I wouldn't have necessarily thought of for a lot of interesting songs. I mean, the first session we did was in New York City with Russell the Dragon, Elevato Engineering, Robert Glasper on Rhodes, and Chris Daddy Dave on drums, and it was just fantastic. I mean, to me, that's like the, m if you're talking about a kind of a jazz and R&B contemporary thing, that's like the most progressive rhythmic trio. And that was the first time they've ever played together mm. as a trio, and it's just fantastic. So he really helped bring in kind of all the elements, you know what I mean? And once we had done that session, we really had a good template of like what the album was going to sound like. We also did a session at his house. He's, he's got a private studio in London with um, Grant Windsor, a great pianist living in London, and Richard Spaven, who I've worked with since 2008 on drums. And this writer, Fink, who is Irish, who writes for John Legend a lot, and he's kind of like a indie folk pop guy. And he came and played guitar, and they just jammed. We all just jammed for like six hours, and we just recorded everything. And from that session, uh, I think about three of the songs came out of that from the album. So it's very organic, you know, process. Well, talk about that process a little bit. How do you get from six hours of material down to three songs? What's your critical? sort of process for evaluating what works and what doesn't? I think, you know, we all kind of, you get in, you, you find something and everyone gets excited and they stay on that, so you kind of remember that. Mm -hmm. So, oh man, go to that part that, you know, where the funk was, you know, you just find the funk, you know. Go, where's the funk, you know, there, oh man. And then, um, you know, we, we had some ideas. Fink came in with some really cool ideas and we kind of transformed all that stuff. Um, I sang on it in kind of like a Marvin Gaye way. Like, I didn't record the the vocal because I wanted just the the room. You know what I mean? But I, you know, just wordless kind of vibing stuff. And so, 
right away I kind of knew in my body like what felt good, you know what I mean? And Fink took it, he chopped up a lot of things and kind of made it more cohesive. Then he sent me that, and so then I could write to it, you know what I mean? And then I could pull things apart as well. Mm. Yeah. You said you just got signed a Blue Note. With all the changes in the record business, and the music business for that matter, what does that mean to be signed to Blue Note? Well, as an artist, I mean, it means it means a lot. You know, it means. I think it means three things for for myself and my career. Um, as a a fan and a lover of music, I mean, when I was in high school discovering jazz, you know, when I when I. I, I did it really like in a chronological order from like Louis Armstrong up. And by the time I got to Blue Note, it was like, oh man, your Horace Silver, Thelonious Monk. You know, it was like this whole treasure trove of composition and, and the sound and the cover art. I mean, everything was so right. And I wanted that, you know, I didn't even know what it meant, but I saw what it was. And it was like, I wanted access to that world. Um, and I, I also feel really privileged to have grown up in a time where you could buy like a Thelonious Monk CD, you know, or the vinyl or whatever. And you spend a lot of time with that object, you know, it's like a fetish, you know, because it's, it's like, it was a real thing that somebody made. And I think it's just different now when you think about an album, that's just this intangible. You don't understand that, you know, it took somebody five years and they did all this studio stuff and all the producers. You don't even read liner notes anymore. You don't know how many people are involved in things anymore, in a way, you know what I mean? Yeah, people don't have this kind of tactile relationship with an MP3. Right. It's just a file. And so I like that about the fetish. Yeah. People do fetishize the physical <laughs> object. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I'll, you know, I cherish my vinyl. I cherish... Um, the art of it, it's art. You know, I, I used to buy records because the cover was cool. Mm. I didn't even care. It was like, oh man, that looks great. So um, it means a lot to me coming from a, a dream, you know, being a, a, a young man, you know, wanting access to this world and now uh, making a statement on that label. I mean, I think it means a lot to me historically as an artist too. It's like, Blue Note has always been the place. I mean, what the slogan is what? The finest in jazz since 1939, right? And um, I feel like it's coming back to that. You know, Wayne Shorter signed. Um, Lionel Lewecki's on there. Robert Glasper's on there. Terrence Blanchard was just re-signed. You know, there's a new Van Morrison album. There's a new Neville, um, uh, Aaron Neville with Keith Richards on guitar. I mean, Don Waz, you know, kind of skipping around, but Don Waz really is bringing in a lot of vision, and it's contemporary, but it's also bringing it back to where Alfred Lyon started. It's like, we want to record great musicians doing what they want to do, and I feel really honored to, to be a part of that process. You mentioned Don Waz. He's the head of Blue Note at this point. Did he give you any guidance for what he had in mind, or did he leave it totally up to you, what your statement would be? Well, when I finally um, when I finally met with Don, I think it was last fall in New York. Um, I had already recorded probably two thirds of the album, so I had a real clear idea. Everything was written. Mm. Uh, basically, I just needed more time, you know, it, it, because Pino is like you know he's on tour with Herbie Hancock, he's on tour with The Who, he's on tour with D'Angelo. I mean. He's a busy man, you know, so I was literally, whenever we could make it work, we made it work. Mm. And, um, you know, much respect to him for, for doing that as well. So I really knew what kind of album it was going to be. And when I first sat down with Don, within five minutes, and, and not prompted by me, we were talking about Brain Feeder, we were talking about Flying Lotus, we were talking about Thundercat. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's out in L.A., he loves that whole scene which I love, you know, and I'm coming from that. So I was like, man, this is like the coolest day in our meeting I've ever had in my life. Mm. Totally, you know, different from, you know, it was just like talking to a musician. And he, he said, yeah, he is a musician, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and a great producer. So it was like, we sat down, he said, hey, do you want to sign the Blue Note? I was like, yeah, he was like, all right, now that that's over with, let's talk about music. 
So it was really like that, you know what I mean? So he didn't say, I really think you need to do this. You know, Trouble, I had already released as a single myself and there was an Oh No remix. Um, so it was already kind of, there was a buzz and he just said, yeah, I love this, do what you do. So I just continued to, to produce the album myself and um, you know, I was pretty sure that I was gonna sign it to Blue Note, but I was really focused on the work. And, and I just wanna kinda say to anybody listening and everybody here tonight, um, it's really important I think to like focus on what you do and not the outcome because it's taken me two years to make this album and I paid for you know every session, all the musicians I hired, you know, and all the food and all the cabs and and you know, it, it's every drop of the journey is is with my own sweat and blood and, and you feel it. You know, when you listen to the music it's really different from anything I've ever done. Um, I don't think I was mature enough to make that kind of statement until now, but I'm really happy that, you know, I'm able to, to have this opportunity. So I just literally turned in the album. He heard it about a month ago at Electric Lady Studios, and he said, don't touch a thing. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. You, you mentioned something interesting, that you had a clear concept already of what it is you wanted to do. Do you have this, does this concept extend to your career? Do you have an idea beyond this record where you want to go, say, in the next five years or the next five records? Absolutely, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, astrologically, I'm on the cusp of Capricorn and Aquarius. Huh. And that, it's very true in my life. You know, the traditionalist, the keeper of the flame, huh. and, you know, the idealist, rule breaker. I'm like, I'm born right in the middle. and. You know, growing up, everybody says, how do you get into jazz? And I always say, Trap Call Quest. You know, I would say samples. You know, that's what got me into loving jazz because Q-Tip said jazz is cool. Digable Planet said jazz is cool. Cypress Hill and Ice Cube sampled, and Rakim, they all sampled jazz and Roy Ayers. I was like, man, what is this? This is this that whole New York hip hop, East Coast, 90s phenomenon got me into it. and. Then I went back and discovered what the music was and began this journey. So for me, it's, it's about a fundamental thing. I mean, when I started out, all I wanted to do was sing like John Coltrane, you know, that, that's it, or Billie Holiday. Those remain my idols, you know. Then I discovered soul, and this is all, I'm like 14, 15, you know. And this is, uh, and Charlie Parker. Then I got into, you know, Al Green and um, Marvin Gaye, and it was like, oh man, you know, there's all this really complex uh, harmony and this emotion too, you know, when you put it with words. So I always loved all this stuff, and hip hop was always kind of the constant thing. Um, but I just think there was a special moment in the 90s where everybody kind of liked everything. You know, you go to see Pulp Fiction, and there's Al Green, and I was like, oh man, this is, it, it just felt, it felt part of contemporary life. It didn't feel old to me. Um, is that the shuffleization of culture? I think so. I think so. Just the way people experience music now is not regimented in boundaries. You only listen to jazz. You only listen to pop or rock or hip hop. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, when I when I made the Dreamer, my first album, I knew it was gonna be. I was coming from total jazz. I mean, I was wearing suits and like the whole thing. And I got signed to this, you know, Giles Peterson, legendary DJ in London. And he's like, yeah, you know what? You can wear suits when you're 60, man. He was like, dress how you dress. You know what I mean? He was like, dress how you dress, do what you do. I'm gonna give you the freedom to be who you wanna be. And I took it and we made the dreamer and it was a great success for me. And because of his, his uh, association, I was often the only band on a festival. It would be like an electronic music fest, all the DJs and a band like myself or a band like Little Dragon. Um, and that was great to me. You know, it was like a thousand people standing up in the club, you know, at two in the morning. That was like, wow. It felt, it felt fresh and it made me feel like I'm a, I'm a contemporary artist doing what I love. You know, I could do Equinox, 
I could do a 20 minute version of Equinox in a club like that and people were like, wow. So it was really, it was really mind blowing for me. So that kind of set the tone as a performing artist for me. Um, jazz still remains very, yeah, I mean, it's my roots, you know, I mean, I, we, were, we were talking earlier, it's like I've had the pleasure of working with Chico Hamilton, who founded the New School, a lot of people don't know that. Junior Mance was the first teacher they hired, you know, at the New School. Um, they were my mentors, you know, they, they looked out for me, they said, hey man, I'm doing a record date, love to get you on it, you know, and I'm terrified, and go in there and, yeah, you sound good, you know, and hang out and tell stories. They really gave me the confidence to do what I'm doing now, which is just speak in my own voice. And what I find with the older masters of jazz, and I'll include McCoy Tyner in that, they don't think about music in the same way that critics and teachers and schools do. They're so open-minded. I mean, they don't like everything. You know, I couldn't play Ludacris for McCoy Tyner. He wouldn't like it, but do you know what I mean? But they never tried to say, man, you should do it like Joe Williams did it. You know, I mean, you know, Junior Mans played with Dinah Washington, you know, J Joe Williams, Johnny Hartman, you know, and he never once said, ah, oh, really, you know, Joe used to do none of that stuff. He was like, man, do it, do it your way, and I'll back you up. I'm just the piano player. My guess is they had people who did the same thing for them. Absolutely. At some point, point in their career. And I imagine you will do that for somebody 10, 20 years down the road. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, are you much of a collector? Like a record collector? Yeah. You know, I used to be. You're not um, I'm not anymore. You know, I um, moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. And I got to a point where I just sold. I Actually, this is kind of a whole other tangent, but I got to a point where I was like, I don't think music is going to it's going to work out for me. Mm -hmm. And I was moving and I sold my entire record collection. I sold my piano. I sold my Gibson. I sold everything. It was like Is this moving from Minneapolis to Seattle or Um this was Brooklyn moving from Brooklyn, Brooklyn to Minneapolis, I think. Huh. Yeah, I'd been in Brooklyn for a few years. And I said, you know, I want to I want to go back and see some family. And you, you know, New York is tough. It's really tough. It's really tough. And if you want to do jazz, it's even harder. And if you want to, you know, do real jazz, it's even smaller. I mean, it's just like because of the competition. Um, because of opportunities. You huh. know, I mean, it's like you really, if you take a step back from it, which I did when I was living in London, you realize, you know, you have some of the most talented young artists all competing to play a $50 gig, you know? And it's like, man, actually, you know, you get so caught up in the art of it that you don't even think about the, your career and kind of a longevity of what you do. And, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always translate for some people that they get to play, you know, bigger festivals and all that kind of stuff. You, you can find yourself caught in a, a smaller world, which maybe you didn't intend to go into you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it, it was deep, you know. And I said, if music is going to come back into my life, it's going to be from a higher place. You know what I mean? And it did. And I'm happy that it did. And from that moment on, I've just followed my spirit. You know, not everybody has liked everything I've done. You know, I know when I worked with Flying Lotus on my second album, who's Alice Coltrane's nephew, a lot of jazz people were like, nah, that's not... I can't go with you there. And on the other side, and the, so that was the Aquarian album, and then the Capricorn album was For All We Know, which is my Verve Impulse debut, which was totally- Just voice and piano. Just voice and piano, and, and I loved it. And all of those people hated it, because they wanted me to keep doing beats, and you know what I mean? So, you know, you, you, you can't please everybody, but this album is gonna please everybody, because it's, it's a complete statement, hmm. you know. I, I call it my first complete statement as an artist, you know, outside of genres. You mentioned beats. As a vocalist, and especially in the choices you have when it comes to phrasing, do you phrase differently with electronic beats versus acoustic? Um, 
That's a really interesting point. Yes and no. Um, I'm from the school of Billie Holiday hmm. for jazz singing like all day. It was, I mean, when we, when we made the dreamer, you know how they, they solo out, you know, like one thing to get a mix. And I was in the studio and they soloed out the vocal and it was just the voice. And it was the first time I had heard myself just singing with the band with what, what I do rhythmically. And I was like, it was so behind the beat. It was so like Billie Holiday. I was like, wow, you know, it's even in my stuff that's there. So Flying Lotus and all those guys, they do this like behind the beat thing and Jay Dilla, you know, from there, it's very like a laid back and it's very swung, you know, it, it comes from jazz rhythmically. So it's not as different as people would think, you know what I mean? It definitely sounds different just because of the samples and I think I think it's less rhythmically different it's more sonically different and harmonically different I mean the main challenge for me when Flying Lotus he sent me like 20 beats you know and it was like it's all in the same key you know I'm a jazz artist I'm like I'm a musician it's like it's it's all G minor you know what I mean so how can you be creative um, melodically you know what I mean because um, rappers don't you know, they don't think in terms of a key. They don't have to. Like, their voice is just, they sound good over anything. But it's the moment that you put a, a note to the word, it's in a key. It's, it's, it has some harmonic relationship to the music. So that was really the challenge. And it was a, it was a welcome challenge uh, for where I was, because I love dubstep, I love, I love beats, I love Mad Lib, I love, um, instrumental music, classical or hip hop or anything. I really love that kind of freedom away from words. You know, I think it opens your mind in a different way because as soon as you say love, as soon as you say fear, as soon as you say I want you, it makes you think of something. But when you just hear a note, you know, then it can open up to anything. When you listen to music, what are you really listening for? Um, I a response, you know, an emotional response, you know. There's a lot of music that to me sounds beautiful and I, I don't feel it and I can't listen to it, you know what I mean? But something that elicits a, an emotional response, um, that's something that, I mean, to me that's what art is about, you know what I mean, any kind of art, um, painting or dance, it should make you, I, I mean, I'd rather have somebody hate my stuff than be like indifferent. I'd rather, I'd rather see somebody walk out of my show than to sit there and be bored. You know Does what anybody I mean? walk out of your shows? Now, no. <laughs> but did, they, did they at one point? When I did the, the For All We Know tour huh. with Jeff Neve, uh, which was my first tour in the United States, um, it was a total disaster, you know, just because I had already put out two albums on Brownswood in London that weren't released in the United States physically. And I hadn't toured those outside of LA or New York. So people really wanted me, you know, this is now my third album. People wanted me to do stuff from the dreamer, you know, and for me, that's really old, you know. And I'm sitting here, you know, with a, a jazz piano player who doesn't even swing, you know what I mean? Like he's coming from a very classical, he's a classical pianist, you know what I mean? And he's great at, he's also actually, He's the pianist in uh, The Artist. He did all the, the really? piano for the movie The Artist, so mm -hmm. big up, Jeff. Um, and you know, it, it, just, it just, that project just rubbed everybody the wrong way, because jazz people want stuff to swing, a lot of traditional people, and be more soulful and bluesy, and I just thought it was a great pairing of this kind of very um, European palette with my kind of soulful voice on it. So. It was tough. So Yoshi's, San Francisco, never forget, man. There was like a row of three dudes, fitted caps on, you know, Nikes, Tim's. They were sitting there in the front row. I come out in a suit and start doing Lush Life. And they were like, out. They just looked at each other and were like, I'm out. And I was like, OK. And, but you know, I've made that choice. And, and it's cool, because for me, it's all music and 
you know, I admire artists like Miles Davis or Michelle and Degicello, people who, or, and, and um, Marvin Gaye, you know, who, who they love what they love. And it's not about, can you sing that song? It's about capturing the artist at that moment because they're giving you the best of where their mind is at, you know what I mean, at that time. So, you know, nobody walks out anymore, you know what I mean? But, you know, I was also experimenting too, kind of going on, on a tangent, but, you know, now it's really all come together musically. Um, so anybody who was there, you know, thank you for letting me evolve, you know. Every city has its own vibe, right? I mean, you've lived in a number of cities. What's the vibe of DC? Well, Chocolate City, man. I mean, you know, it's, it's deep because I actually lived here for like four months. And uh, where'd you live? What part of the city? South. It's been East, a while. South probably southeast. southeast. Yeah, it was southeast. Yeah. Yeah. Which okay. was cool. It was cool. And, uh, you know, we used to hang out on U Street and, you know, try to get into it. I feel like, you know, DC's always had that kind of like southern cosmopolitan blend, which I think is so fascinating. You know what I mean? Even just getting off the train today, you know, people are like, how you doing? You know, I was like, oh, like nobody talks to anybody in New York. You know what I mean? They don't care how you're doing. They don't want to know. They're always, it's, people were like all of a sudden looking me in the eye and kind of like, it felt positive, you know, and it was nice. You know, for me, it's just nice to be around black people, period, you know. And especially being in, you know, coming from Minneapolis, which is a very segregated city, extremely. It's, it's changed now. Um, you know, now it's very mixed, and there's a lot of, like, Somali. And, um, but when, when I was growing up, it was like the lines were drawn, and it was really, it was a pretty brutal place to grow up in, in a lot of ways culturally. So I always kind of feel, you know, um, the, the cultural temperature of a place, that's kind of what hits me first, you know, how people interact with each other, how they talk, how they treat one another. And um, I feel like DC has always shown me so much love and respect, you know what I mean? From everybody that I've, I, you know, including, you know, just today we came sound check and everybody's been fantastic. So um, it's always a pleasure for me to be, you know, in DC, especially with Obama. <laughs> Do you ever get with the go-go here? Oh yeah, I mean, there's actually a, well, Chris Dave, is he from DC? Does anybody know? I don't know if he's from DC, but he's got, he's got a lot of that, to, to me, I hear a lot of like go-go and stuff and, and what he does. And there's a track that we're gonna do tonight. It's called, It's All Over Your Body. And I was like, what is he doing? How did they, you know, him and Pino just got into this groove. And I realized a couple months later, man, that's, it's actually go-go. But it's not straight, you know what I mean? They, they play it in a different way, but that's, it's that kind of beat, you know what I mean? There's a New York go-go and there's a DC go-go. <laughs> DC is a bit more round, mm, mm, you know? Mm. You can move with it. You know Ben Williams? The basis? Yeah, we played last night in New York. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, he's he's busted wide open. Um, your father was a musician. Yep, still is. What does he play? He plays. He's one of those like total, you know, genius guys who can play anything. I mean, his main instrument is tenor saxophone. Hmm. Um, he plays flute. He plays soprano sax. He plays Latin percussion. Also, like the congas. Timbales, uh, bongos. Those are his main instruments. And then he also sings and he plays guitar and bass. You know, one time I went over to his house and he had like a, uh, one of those huge frame drums, like a, the, 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 the Irish drum. Yeah, and Bo Bodron, I think. Yeah, and he just had bought it, you know, and was like, oh, I, got a, I got a gig with this tomorrow. And he literally like went and bought one and taught himself how to play for the gig. It was like, I don't have that gift, you know, I can't play. I, I can write, but I don't have that, like sit down and play anything gift, you know, which actually I like because I feel like it focuses me on what I'm good at, you know. Which is what? 
What do you think you're good at? Uh, I feel like I'm a bridge. You know, I'm good at I'm good at um, curating. You know, bringing a lot of different kind of artists mm. on the same stage. I'm good at creating a space um, that I I like to welcome people into. I think my voice is the way that people get into it. But what I'm interested in is is the rest of what's around my voice. I spend a lot of time on stage listening to the band. You know what I mean? Um, I'm good at, um, you know, putting putting words. I think to atmospheres in a in a poetic sense. You know what I mean? I don't know if I'd even call myself a jazz singer when we think of like Ella Fitzgerald or you know Billie Holiday or Nat King Cole. I think it's different now because people are writing their own stuff. You know what I mean? To me, that's the the repertoire. That's like the main question if you're talking about jazz singers today. It's repertoire. It's do you go on stage and do you sing Summertime with your arrangement and all, or do you sing something that you wrote? That's that's what's changing. You know, Gretchen Parlato, someone like Becca Stevens, who they don't consider a jazz singer, but she's, you know, in terms of theory and technique, she's way more advanced than I am in in what we think of as jazz harmony and stuff. So, you know, you know, my generation and 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 under really we don't think about these things. I mean, I was talking to Ben Williams about it last night. It's like it's just music. You know, I mean, his his record, he's doing Michael Jackson songs because that's what he loved. So it's like if you're gonna cover something, you kind of cover what. You and, and that's the thing too, it's like it's called a cover. It's not like, here's a perfect example of how things have changed. When I did Freestyle Fellowships, Park Bench People on The Dreamer, mm -hmm. which is based on Red Clay, right. as you know, um, a lot of hip hop people didn't like that. And for me, I was like, I'm a jazz singer who's from a hip hop generation. This is a standard. For me, this is I'm I'm pulling this into my repertoire as a new standard. I'm putting it up there with summertime, or for all we know. They look at it as in the pop world you call it a cover, or in hip hop you call it biting. It's like stealing? Exactly. Yeah. So they're like, man, you just you you're biting freestyle fellowship. Because in hip hop you don't ever rap somebody else's stuff unless unless it's like they've passed away. And you want to throw a couple bars, and it's like a celebration, An homage. Yeah. So people got really. There's still there's still people who are really upset that I covered that song. Freestyle Fellowship's not upset because I asked them about it before I did it, and Jam Master Divine's not upset. You you upset about it? <laughs> well, people got you know they they got upset about it. So, you know, I thought that was just really interesting. You know. So it's the repertoire that's really changed. The essential connecting with an audience and putting your ideas across, that doesn't change. That's, it's always been the case, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So music, in, it's often been said, music's a language, right? And you're writing these stories when you write your lyrics. What are these stories about to you? Um, well, again, I'm very influenced by I guess we call it modern jazz. So especially the later 50s into the early 60s, um, Eric Dolphy, we were talking about earlier, John Coltrane, those guys, Ornette, those guys who took all that language and started like speaking in a different way before it got really free. I really love that kind of moment where, you know, you get a track like Equinox that's so melodic, but sar harmonically sophisticated. So. I started out as a lyricist writing to John Coltrane solos. That's where I came from, you know, King Pleasure, Eddie Jefferson, John Hendrix. I love that whole thing. The vocalese. The vocalese, yeah, yeah. tradition. And um, there was all this space because hardly anybody had written to Coltrane stuff. I think John Hendrix has written a few solos. But so I, I just went in there just for fun. And that's kind of that's kind of where the basis came from. And with Coltrane, for me, the best approach was to make it personal, but make it super abstract at the same time. 
So the meaning is open for interpretation. I know what it means for me, but if you listen to it, you don't necessarily know. And I don't necessarily want you to know because I want you to have your own experience. I want you to say, well, it could be, it could be that, you know? So when I, when I write lyrics, I mean, I don't sit down and think, well, today I'm going to write about this. I mean, it just comes out. I'm inspired by the music that I create. Um, but there are moments that, you know, I put in and, and, uh, and, and feelings about love, feelings about relationships. I mean, most of it is about, I think that's what most of our human life is about relationships, you know, with, you know, our past, with our parents, with our loved ones, with friends, family, uh, with God, you know, um, with ourselves. I mean, it's, that's what it's all about for me. So, you know, a track like Desire, you know, she appeared in the distance like a, a prayer I had uttered once. What does that mean, you know? You know what I mean? It could be a real person or it could be a, a, a vision. It could be a dream you had. And for me, it's all those things. It's a real person. It's a, a vision I had. It's a dream I had. She can be, you know, the creative part of you. She can be your lover. She could be your mother. She could be, you know what I mean? So I'm telling a story, but I always want to leave it open for interpretation. You know, I think that's my gift as a writer. What's the real challenge to writing a lyric that you're not going to cringe over after singing it a hundred times? Um... I don't know. I don't even, I don't think about it. I just write it down and record it and it's done. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't question where it comes from. It just comes and that's it. You know, everything, all my best work has come like that. The Dreamer, the title track, um, Code. I've always had these tracks too that just like broke open. They were like the blueprint for the album. You know what I mean? And I never sit down and like belabor over a line and like writers have to do and edit themselves, you know what I mean? I just sit down, oh, that's what it is. And it, I look back and it's like that, that's it. You never tinker with things? You never, how do you know when you're done with a lyric? Just when you come to the There's end? There's no more notes. <laughs> There's no more notes, yeah. Hmm. Um, do you think there's some kind of code to jazz? And if so, how did you unlock it? Uh, well, there are so many codes to jazz. You know, Talk about them. I mean, you know, when we say jazz, that means a lot of things. I mean, I guess I always think of like a lineage of the greats who have kind of defined this music and, and kind of risen up every, you know, decade and just bam, this is where the music's going now. This is where the music's going now. And I think, you know, the blues, all, the, you know, wh what they all have in common is the blues, um, church, gospel music, you know, um, a f it's really folk, you know, it's this folk, American, deep, taking it back, you know, and, and like, no matter how far a train went, he could always, you know, play the blues, or net, it all comes from the same kind of place. And all the, all the best, in my mind, players, Stan Getz or, you know, Bill Evans, they could also play the blues. I think that's like where the code is. I feel like if you can't play blues, and I mean like a s straight up 12 bar or eight bar or, you know what I mean? If you can't do that, then you will never understand black music. And that's the whole foundation of jazz. So how do you reconcile then, or maybe it doesn't need reconciling, but how do you balance the folk expression with the art? Well, it, the art was in there. I mean, you know, it was always there. You know, it's like, I don't think people have thought of it as art. You know, they just thought of it as expression, and I think that's when real art happens. I think when you start thinking of things really conceptually, um, that's when it gets weird, you know what I mean? It's like when, you know, Louis Armstrong wasn't like, man, you know, today I'm gonna do this crazy thing that no one's gonna understand, you know what I mean? I feel like that's what kids today now, they go to music school and they're like, I'm gonna write this progression that's so advanced that 
no one's gonna get it but me and like my guys, cause I, you know, we're all gonna practice and everyone's gonna be so impressed by this amazing progression that we came up with. It's like, that's not what, what Louis Armstrong was doing. You know, it advanced because the music was ready to advance and he had, he was a genius. I mean, these are, these are geniuses, you know. Van Gogh wasn't like, I'm gonna, you know, change this, I'm gonna use a lot of paint because it, you know, to mess everybody's head up. He, that's just where he went, you know. And yet the narrative that sort of frames a lot of this music and the public discussion of this music has also changed where people talk about jazz as America's classical music. Mm. And that's what I'm always trying to reconcile is this sort of expression of soul that is also supposed to be this sort of rarefied classical. Yeah. Can it be both? Well, I mean, it is both. You know, I mean, you go to Lincoln Center, you see a lot of music that you won't see anywhere else and vice versa. There's a lot of music I see in New York that'll never be at Lincoln Center, you know? So, you know, now music just exists, you know, it's, it's just there. And whatever you call it doesn't matter, I think, at all, you know what I mean? And it, it, to me, it's funny because, you know, like all the reviews of like Robert Glasper's album, is it jazz, you know, it's like, nobody cares. Like that, that question is not even, I don't even think it's relevant because, okay, it's not jazz. And that's fine too. You know, it, it's a, that's not even like the question to ask. It's, it's like, why is he doing that? What's it, what does he want to say right now? You know, what is this expression? That's the question to ask to me, you know, um, I think, I think what got messed up was that jazz, so-called jazz, was the music of the people, you know, that people, it was popular. And it was, it was more than popular, it was what gangsters listened to. It was what people danced to. It's what people put on, you know, to relax and cook to, you know what I mean, in their house. It was like, it was a part of their life. It was music that connected to people on a, on a social level. And it wasn't, nobody trying to hit you over the head would look how fantastic I am. You know, then things started to change, you know, with bebop. And since then, it has evolved into this um, something else, you know. So I think what I want to do, and I feel like what Esperanza Spalding wants to do, Ben Williams and Robert Glasper and this new generation of, of artists, and the Bad Plus as well, you know, we want to just make music that connects to people. We want our friends to come and see us, you know. We want, last night I played at Le Poisson Rouge in New York, and that's a place where, you know, it's affordable to come to. It's, you can sit down, you can stand up, you can talk, you can text, you can Twitter, and we don't care. You can enjoy it in any way that you want, you know, and I like that. You know, I think that's how I wanna see music as well. Yeah, at the same time, when I want to go see a string quartet, you know, I'm going to dress a certain way, I'm going to act a certain way because that's the culture. So I, I always think of it as more of like you're stepping into houses of culture. This is a house of culture. Mm -hmm. It's already defined by the, at, you know, the architecture and the atmosphere. So I, to me, that's more important than um, what you call the music. It's where is the music played and for who. Mm -hmm. That was like a really long answer. <laughs> How do you feel when you look out into the audience and you see people taking photos of you or documenting your performance? Or uh, does any of that bother you? Do you see that as? Not at all. No. Yeah, not at all. Do you encourage it? Um, I don't discourage it. I mean, for me, like, you know, I think, I mean, celebrity has just changed. I mean, the amount of wealth in the in the music industry, you know, you you grow up. I I was I was there for the transition from hip hop being like this underground, you know, want to sell your mixtape locally, you know, the Fugees or whatever, and to them blowing up and and being like, you know, platinum artists. And as a kid, I watched that, you know, and it, and it was like, and I've also now seen a lot of those artists kind of crumble after that intense wealth. So for me, it is what it is, and you have to deal with 
what it is. You know, if you want to, you know, Keith Jarrett is an exception, obviously, you know, but um, if you want to have people be into you who are a certain a age, they're going to tweet about it. They're gonna, they want to take pictures. They want to share it. And how about if they record it? Great. You know, I mean, music, let's, let's be honest, music's free and there's no way to stop. You know, that debate is over. People will pay for music if they want to, but that's a, that's it's their choice. It's it's completely individual choice. It's like voting. You vote for who you want to, or you don't. You know. So you're okay if somebody in the audience records tonight's video records tonight, and it shows up on YouTube tomorrow. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, you like that? Hopefully, they it's not all crazy, and you know. As long as it's steady. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's great to kind of have this. You know, I don't, I don't know if you can call it permanent because we don't know what technology is going to do or the internet, what it's going to do. But, you know, I spend a lot of time on YouTube trying to find some rare James Brown moment or, you know what I mean? Like, and that's amazing, you know, to, to when you find something, you know, the Nicholas Brothers, I mean, artists like, that. that's a good example, the Nicholas Brothers, they're so a few examples of great footage of them doing what they do. Um, and it's all in movies, which is great, but I would love to see, you know, them just messing around backstage, man, to them like, you know, those kind of moments. So I think, I think you have to wade through a lot of stuff, you know, cats riding monkeys or whatever, you know, on YouTube, <laughs> but like, there are these gems, you know, Stevie Wonder in Germany, you know, that, that just surface up and we're talking about, you know, it, if, if there exists, which we, kind of feel like it's out there somewhere, West Montgomery with John Coltrane. Um, and as a fan of the music, you just want to hear it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but here, here's the real question. Sure. I mean, and the reason I ask this is who owns the music or is that even a concern or consideration for you? I mean, you want my real answer on that? You know? Sure. Yeah. Don't we want the real answer? Yeah. Honestly, like, I'd say God owns the music. That's... Does God own the publishing? <laughs> God doesn't care about publishing. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I mean, for real, like, I'm not religious or anything, but I know that any artist, any musician knows that music comes from a spiritual place that you can't define. And if you want to call that God or whatever, whatever it is, that's where it comes from. So you know, that's where music, that's where it belongs, that's where it goes, that's what you're giving back to the source, that's what you're getting from the source. So, you know, I don't really, I'm not in this to like, get rich, I'm not in this to, you know, do all that stuff, you know what I mean? I'm in this because I was called to do it. That's it, there's no way I could not do this. You know, there's no way I could not sing tonight, it's just impossible. So. It's just the way that it is. I mean, you have no control over it either. And again, I think it's a generational thing. A lot of people get mad. It's like, no pictures and no, no autographs. And you know, I'm, I'm the artist and there's a wall here and you stay on your side and that's the way it is. Man, you know, that's kind of boring. You know, mm -hmm. people, people want to know who you are. You don't have to give up your life, but it's like, we're all fascinated by people. You know, Quentin Tarantino. Why did he get Samuel Jackson? That's fascinating to me. You know what I mean? Like, why is he into all the, you know, kung fu movies and black exploitation? Why is he such a nerd? I want to know. I don't just want to see the movie, you know, and I think that's we have access now to these kind of interviews and these thoughts. And I think that's that's the art now. It's like why do people think the way they do, you know? And for me, you know, anything that's out there that leads people to my thought process or things like today, you know what I mean? I think it's great because that's what kids need now, you know what I mean? And, and the larger conversation is not really do I care if it's documented, it's about who gets to see what, you know, it's still about access to, to um, information, you know? Because 
still a lot of people still don't have computers in the world. You know what I mean? A lot of people still don't have regular access to things on the internet. You know, I went to China and just forgot. I was so jet lagged. I was like, let me check my Facebook. Wrong. I was like, wow, let me, oh, this YouTube, nope. You know what I mean? And it really hit me being over there. It was like, that's why this stuff is important. You know, because somebody can tape something from a show, put it up on the internet. If I like it, I'll post it on Facebook or my team will put it on Twitter. Somebody in Kyoto is like, man, this new Jose. Because, you know, some, some people just, you just can't ever access the artist. You know what I mean? There's somebody. Now, would, would you ever think to ask someone or ask YouTube to take something down? I put it like this I would never do anything in public uh, that uh. I didn't want to be recorded. You know what I'm saying? Everything. I mean, I, I don't even think about the question. It's like, yeah, anything that people want to record, whatever. It's totally cool because it's just publicity. And if you're good, then people want to watch it, you know. But you, I mean, you, you know. You used an interesting word uh, a couple times, and that's information. We are certainly still, I think, in an information age. What do you think is the difference between information and knowledge? Well, knowing how to use that information, you know what I mean? I mean, that's the joke of like a dictionary. It's like, you want to learn how to spell a word, you have to look it up. You know what I mean? It's like, y everything's available, but if you don't know what you're looking for, then it's like you're not even opening up the book. You know what I mean? So yeah, wading through, wading through all of this deluge of you know, information that comes in and what's important, you know, learning how to have taste in, in, um, and trust, you know, that's, that's really important. And how did you develop taste and trust? Well, I was pre-internet. I think, I think the internet really does something to our brains. You know, you, it floods you with so much that you just, you just, it's the power of it. It's the speed of it. You're like entranced by it. You know, I go to like, look up a recipe when I'm cooking and like, 30 minutes later, like the food is burning and I'm like watching some like movie on Netflix or something, you know what I mean? It's like, it just takes you in this whole place. I mean, you know, I read a lot. I think reading is really important because you control the pace of the story, you know what I mean? And I think there's nothing as powerful as like being so into a book that you have to like put it down because you want, you, you're like, oh, I don't want this to end, you know what I mean? I mean, really, reading literature is the only art form that you have power over the, the speed of which you take it in, I think, you know what I mean? I mean, looking at paintings, you could argue that too, but yeah. everything else happens in real time, dance, music, cinema, you know what I mean? What's so the last book you read that you couldn't put down? Um, I know this one. What was it? I just read it. Uh, I'm reading like five books right now. So the, la the last book that I finished that I was like, I don't want this to end was Norm Baker Park by Anthony Giardina. And that was a book that um, I didn't expect to like because it's such a, I didn't expect to love. He's a great writer, but I didn't expect to, to love it because it's just such a different experience. It's about like working class, um, Italian, Western Massachusetts history kind of, you know, in generations, which is not, you know, it's not my experience. But I got into it and it just, wow. I got into all the characters and the story and found myself and, you know, you're in those last 30 pages and you're just like, man, I don't want this to end, you know what I mean? Beloved Toni Morrison, I'm reading that for like the 20th time. You know, that, I mean, that's, to me, that's like the ultimate American novel for me personally. You know, if I, Toni Morrison were sitting on the stage with us, what would you want to talk to her about? What would you ask her? Um, I'd ask her about her new novel, <laughs> which I haven't read yet. Um, you know, I, those kind of people, like um, like McCoy, you know, McCoy Tyner, you know, 
when you're around them, they're masters. And it, it's not about literature or music. It's about they have reached a certain point as human beings. They've evolved to this plateau. And it doesn't mean that they can't drink or cuss or whatever, you know what I mean? But they've, 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 they've reached a place that everything they do, it emanates, you know? So when I'm around somebody like that, I mean, I just name dropping right now, but I just sang for Aretha Franklin's 70th birthday party like a, two months ago or something like that. And long story short, Chris Bowers, who's a fantastic pianist, the winner of Thelonious Monk International Piano Competition. Um, he plays in my band, she loves him, he was, she was a judge. She called him to, to play it and said, bring a singer, and it was me, thankfully, mm -hmm. you know, and. What did you sing for Aretha? I sang Trouble, I sang my stuff, I sang Trouble, I sang Save Your Love For Me, Buddy Johnson, and I sang Do You Feel, which is off the new album, which I'm gonna do tonight. And she was fantastic, you know, and just, just someone like her, the way that she comes into a room tells you everything you need to know about who she is, you know. So, it Tony, I mean, I, I saw Toni Morrison recently at a reading, and just the way she comes up to the podium is like, tells you everything, you know, that you need to know about who she is, the way people carry themselves, the way people, yeah. I mean, Miles used to say that he could tell uh, how good a musician was by the way he carried his, his, his instrument, by the relationship he had with it. And that's true, man. It's absolutely true. And yet at the same time, wouldn't you like to ask Miles a question? Well, I would like to ask Miles, like, <laughs> if he would give me a real answer, yeah, but yeah. he would give me a lot of BS probably. You know what I mean? It's like, and that's, that's the thing, is like sometimes you meet these greats and they're not the nicest people. You catch them on the wrong day and it kind of kind of crush your, it kind of it like takes away from the point of what they do. You know, I think, I think all the answers are in the, the music or in the artistry. Um, I mean, I did meet, that said, I did meet Al Green and he was so fantastic and warm. And it's nice to know that, you know, that, that feeling, that humanness matches the music. Mm. You know what I mean? We're nearing the end. I wanna make sure I ask you a couple more questions. One is, I, I'd like for you to name two or three recordings that really changed your life? Um, I have to say, it's a tough one, really. I mean, there was, a, there was a, a group of three recordings that changed my direction. It was the first three things that I bought, and it was um, Charlie Parker on Verve, like the compilation, it was like 13, you know. The best of Charlie Parker, whatever, and um, Duke Ellington, this is all cassette tape too, by the way. Duke Ellington from the Cotton Club, it was like the, the radio stuff. And um, Louis Armstrong. And those three influences really put me on a path, you know what I mean, um, to where I am today. But I have to say, you know, Coltrane sound, in terms of a jazz album that really just Bam, you know, Central Park West is on there. Equinox is on there. Um, I've written lyrics to both of those. And that really helped define my kind of entry into jazz. I think the hardest thing now is for people, young jazz artists, is like, how do I, what do I have to say? How do I get into it, you know? Um, contemporary stuff, you know, Ice Cube the Predator was a huge emotional album for me because the Rodney King riots had happened. And that's when I couldn't look to jazz to kind of express what was happening right now in our culture. So, uh, you know, I was young and, and mad and that album was very angry and, and rightfully so. So that was a uh, uh, really eye opener is that you could be really political and intelligent. You know, there's a lot on that album that I, I cringe about today, but at the time it really connected um, politically and emotionally and then I have to say kind of blue, you know. To me, that's the ultimate um, jazz record because everything is on there, you know. Everything that you, that you love about jazz 
is on that instrumental jazz is on that album to me there's always more yeah and i'll look forward to continuing this conversation sometime thank, thank you, you jose james thank you this has been a presentation of the library of congress visit us at loc.gov